Hey guys, Filthy Robot here doing another Guides, Tips, and Tricks video. This time we're talking about Urtok the Desolation. And this is a newbie guide for that game. Um, this is a small uh, release, currently in early access, so understand a lot of this information may change, but I'm hoping to be uh, gen general enough in the advice and what I'm talking about that it should be applicable to future iterations of this game, not just the current build that it exists in. All right, so starting off the campaign, um, Actually, even before that, some quick settings. I really recommend moving the battle speed up. You'll find as you play this game a lot, it has a lot of grindy tactical fights, which are super fun, but it will get repetitive uh, and removing some of the animation speed really made that experience uh, much more enjoyable for me. Uh, one of the great things about this developers is included that as a base option in your game. Um, starting the campaign, you'll be prompted to select from uh, a number of different character choices. I'm going to do a brief walkthrough of what they're like, uh, understanding again that many of these stats will change throughout the pre-release. Um, after you beat the game, you'll have option to uh, unlock other factions like vampires, werebeasts, or uh, necro reavers, and possibly others as the game develops. But to begin with, you start with essentially a human faction. Um, your options are priest, javelinier, how oh, I have no idea how to say this, javelinier, uh, assassin, guardian, blood knight, war monk, footman, hunter, uh, Berserker, Spearman, and then back to the Priest. Uh, you get to start with three. Your party will eventually have uh, six active members in it, uh, and you can have many, many more, but each fight you'll have a cap of six people to deploy on the field at any given time. Um, the Priest essentially acts as a support melee uh, with a number of healing spells affecting healing and protection spells affecting other people. Uh, uses life as a resource. Um, the Jave Lanier is essentially a shorter range archer with better accuracy shooting through objects since he throws over in a higher arc. Um, basically support ranged, uh, damage dealer that is. Uh, the Assassin is a melee, um, melee uh, damage dealer focusing on positioning, high damage, high mobility, um, fairly squishy, uh, but does a lot of actions per round and a lot of damage per round. Um, the Guardian is a support melee character uh, set up to protect your other characters, often from range fire, but often from melee as well. Um, doesn't do a lot of damage or impact in of itself, but has a flexibility of positioning, uh, both knocking the enemy around and then protecting your, your uh, units themselves. The Blood Knight is a highly mobile flanker kind of unit. Uh, it's designed to do high damage while keeping some self-sustain up uh, to pick off enemy units uh, with a mobility kind of charging ability. The War Monk is a, another highly mobile unit, more of a tanky highly mobile unit, uh, able to reach places that other characters can't with its jump ability. Unlike a dash ability, it's not just further movement, it actually lets you go up and down terrain and uh, up around obstacles that other classes wouldn't be able to. Um, it has by far the most unique movement of all the units in the game um, and doesn't do a lot of damage, um, although supposedly it can be set up that way. I haven't found that to be the case, uh, but is mostly about controlling an area uh, and has more of these movement style effects that are make the tactics in this game so unique. Uh, has a flip ability where it can toss enemies over its head uh, into locations they don't want to be in. Um, Footman is a combination support uh, damage dealer kind of. Um, it is a little bit more mobile than a lot of the classes having a charge ability. The charge does push the enemy back so it's not just movement for yourself it's also movement for the enemy. Um, a little bit more heavily armored like the Guardian so it has some uh, ability to regenerate armor over time so it becomes a little bit more tanky. Um, at the moment it needs a little bit of love in my opinion but um, early access I expect it will be patched out. And the Hunter which is your uh, kind of generic ranged damage dealer having some control over the battlefield with uh, traps, movement inhibiting traps, as well as fairly good range damage over time. Um, not much more to be said about that. And then the Berserker is a melee damage dealer that cares a lot less about position, takes a lot of damage, deals a lot of damage. Uh, one of your biggest heavy hitters, and particularly effective versus enemies with armor. And then finally, the Spearman, which is about area of effect denial, um, able with spear wall to control a flank um, if you build them right and position them right to keep a number of enemies away from your guys and therefore preventing their damage. Another support character, not particularly high damage in of itself, uh, but very good at a force multiplying. All right, that gets through them. 
Um, currently, there are four difficulty settings. I recommend starting on Epic Journey. The Desolation is a massive, whereas these are all pretty scaling. And if you like an easier game, clearly select an easier option. Uh, but I recommend learning on Epic Journey. Um, the Desolation right now is very different. It's kind of like um, almost like a survival mode in the sense that it changes so many stats to make uh, your character weaker, your characters weaker and the enemy stronger, that it's a very different gameplay experience than Epic Journey. Um, you're going to be prompted to choose two items as a new player. Um, these are these are uh, gear items, all the equipment, and that will change depending on what team you select. It will give you different gear, gear items to choose between because this is the gear that they can use. Um, I don't really recommend starting these. These will be replaced fairly quickly and fairly often throughout the course of your adventure. So I don't really recommend picking gear items at all. What I actually recommend picking are, um, are what are called uh, mutators in this game. And mutators are um, basically trinkets that are upgradable and eventually can be absorbed directly into the characters. The character can carry a number of these actively on them at any time, giving them special abilities. Uh, but if you use them long enough, the character can choose to absorb them as part of that character permanently. Um, and these are upgradable over time. I recommend choosing either two of these mutators or as a very new player, perhaps extra medicine and one of these mutators. Um, extra medicine is gonna let you um, recover let your campaign recover from mistakes that you make on the tactical side of the game where you lose characters but they don't die they just become injured when they first are wounded all right getting through that starting the game um i don't recommend starting on iron man the game is not buggy um the game is actually very stable even in early access even on the beta branches um but there is a fair amount of um grindiness and punishing that you may want to be able to load from as a new player Hey guys, let's talk a little bit about the strategic layer of Urtuk. So uh, this is the strategic map. The black represents Fog of War. As you move closer to Fog of War, it repeals back to reveal the nodes that you can move to. Uh, your movement is restricted to these nodes and moving to a node requires a day. So you can see that 77 days have elapsed. If I were to move to this location here, that takes a day. Um, other enemies on the, uh, on the map will move at the end of your turn and your uh, and things like missions will complete at the end of this turn. It takes days as a resource to do. So I'm gonna show you just a little, little bit more about that. Um, enemies scale across the course of the game. The later into the game you are, the more scaling the enemies will experience. So there is a uh, motivation to be uh, thoughtful in the approach and movement that you choose, because if you wait too long, the enemies will scale more rapidly than perhaps you are scaling if you're avoiding fights or something like that. Uh, supposedly the scaling's less or reduced, either reduced or gone on map one, uh, but the future, the other maps past that all have additional scaling. The next resource is Trillium. This is a kind of generic kind of gold almost currency in this game. It's used for a number of different things. You can use it to retreat from enemy fights that you don't want to take by bribing the enemy that you uh, engage with. You can use it to purchase mercenaries from a number of different locations, either from uh, conquered fortresses or from places like the, uh, where is it? The Armorer's Guild or the uh, Black Market. And some uh, of your people that you rescue may uh, get a, a perk called Wage. And if they get a perk called Wage, you will have to pay them a weekly wage as well. Uh, so that will all be used with Trillium. And then finally, you can buy items from locations, again, like the Armor Smith, uh, where you can spend money on. So all these things are uses for Trillium. Um, medicine is a resource needed to heal injured people. People, If you have a character die for the first time when he's uninjured on a tactical map, he will actually become injured. He'll be removed from that fight, but he'll still be available after that fight. Uh, at that case, you need to heal them. It takes one medicine to heal them. You can craft medicine from using blood and flushed uh, 40 of each to craft one medicine and uh, healing a character will give it a timer before it becomes uninjured this timer goes up every time they're injured so if a character gets injured like 10 times in a game the amount of time it takes for each injury to be cured is longer um, and if they are if they are killed again while they're injured they're dead for good uh, so it represents one of the limiting resources of your game um, life essence is what you use to purchase the trinkets in this game, the mutators. So when you finish a fight, you'll have the option of uh, a number of mutators. The mutators are based on the traits that your enemies had in that fight. So if you want to collect um, flesh eaters and you need to fight enemies that have flesh eating, generally beast type units to do that, and you'll have to purchase them at the end of a fight. There'll be a limited number available from that fight and that's used for life essence. Life essence is also used to respec your characters. Um, if you want to change their attribute points around. And it's probably the 
most valuable resource as the game stands right now. Um, Blood and Flesh have two basic resource uses each. The first is they are used to pay for um, special types of units that you can recruit or convert into. Vampires and Werebeasts both uh, require one of these resources. And you can also convert Blood and Flesh into Bandages, which is uh, another important resource that you'll be using for that. That's basically all they're used for. And Alcohol is a resource used to level your characters outside of fighting. So every character gets experience for both being in the fight as well as for killing units in the fight. But you can send units off on a special mission from this interface going to Mission to um, training and if you send them training um, they'll disappear from your available characters for two days uh, as they go training they'll take a, I think it's 30 alcohol to do that and they'll come back with an extra level so that's what's going to happen for these resources uh, in the center of your screen here are the events that are occurring around you right now for example we have bounty hunters chasing us for stealing I think a relic um, actually they're not relic hunters or bounty hunters are sent after us for some other reason that I don't remember right now um, but this that's these guys on the board with the like area with 15 that means there's 15 bounty hunters moving and they're one day away from where we are right now the red arrow represents us you can always find yourself by focusing camera on party um, we have a global event called earthquake which means on every tactical map we play on for the next 12 days there will be an earthquake event occurring uh, as well as a global uh, calamity called intoxication um, earthquake is a terrain modifier and um, intoxication is a stat modifier. So both of these things will be active for the next 12 and 13 days. And then it's also telling us one of our units who's infected with the werebeast virus has transformed back into a human temporarily. These things are dismissible if you don't want to see them, but it's helpful to have this stuff uh, available for you. Uh, to know what's going on. Um, all right, let's talk about moving around the map, the types of things you encounter for that. Um, the, as I said, the brackets and the number represent the number of enemies there. There's a number of different types of places you can go to. The primary one of interest are villages. These are these, these unsealed villages are villages I've already captured. I've cleared them, captured them, and then searched them. And searching them, I've unsealed the tunnels beneath them. This is how you advance uh, uh, zones in Urtuk. But if we look around, we can probably find a village that I haven't done that with yet. Um, uh, there's a village that I have not captured and you can see that it has 12 enemies that the type of defender is a beast defender and that if I do capture it will give me seven flesh per day which doesn't stay seven flesh per day it starts at seven and ticks down by one per day uh, and that's capturable for us. Um, the other location similar to a village is a fortress which is a nastier um, village. The village tends to have slightly less people and the terrain is a little bit more favorable. It's a little bit uphill. They tend to be clumped together but it's not uh, devastating. Fortresses are much more devastating. Uh, they are designed to be a pain in the ass. You can, uh, but fortresses have a much better resource acquisition from them than villages do. So if you do take uh, fortresses, you can get a huge boost in um, pretty much all your resources and have the option to recruit the faction from that fortress. So if I conquered this fortress here, I will have two random types of swampers available for recruitment if I want to recruit them. All right, um, the basic node is just what you're moving around on from location to location. So if we are here on this red one, if I were to go to this node, I could move there. There's nothing on that node. This node has a hidden cave, which will tell me what type of fight it is by reading the tooltip, et cetera, et cetera. So your goal on each map is to get to the next map. The first three maps to do that, you are searching villages. You have to conquer villages and then search them. Um, it's easy to forget to search them. So if we're here, we're gonna go back to this village. There's a button at the bottom called search site. You're gonna wanna do that on villages to make sure that you um, clear them out entirely. And I think that about covers the strategic map. Just that some enemies will pursue you. Um, relic hunters or cultists who support the relic and bounty hunters will chase you. And you can path in ways to prevent them from catching you. Like this guy's trying to move towards us. If I move there, end of the turn, he'll move uh, to try to uh, block us. And then you can send people on missions too. So the other thing I guess I could talk about while we're on the strategic layer is your characters. So um, the missions are a leveling mission which I've already showed you, scavenge mission which sends them off with a chance to return with stuff. They also have a chance to become injured from it in scout area which is going to be a couple days uh, mission. They can't be injured on it but they will reveal a bit more fog of war than it would otherwise. If one of your units is infected with a uh, disease you can send them to be cured at a cost of resources. Um, I do have someone who's infected, there he is. If I wanted to send them on a mission to cure that I can do that. It costs me money to cure them and they'll be gone for a certain number of days. Anytime someone's on a mission, they're unavailable for fighting and your primary character cannot be sent on missions. It's just not available as an option. Let's go through the stats on each of these guys. Um, strength is a damage stat. Vitality is a health stat. Uh, all stats are actually pretty good in this game, pretty useful. Um, so 
In, whereas in some games, vitality is just never important on some characters. That's pretty much not true here. Um, all of these stats are beneficial for all of these characters in a pretty meaningful way. So you will have some real decisions to make about how you assign stats. Anyway, strength is damage stat. Vitality is a HP stat. Agility is a combination... Um, stamina and turn order stat it's one of the most important stats in the game and concentration is the stat that uh, controls focus game your characters behave um your characters generate a, a resource called focus after level four and focus kind of unlocks their kind of almost like an ultimate ability so when you reach max focus you will have the character's focus added to a communal pool of focuses that you can use and it's generally a very powerful ability that's going to massively impact the, the tactical fight i'll show you this when we get to the tactical layer uh, but concentration controls the generation of that so you can build and make a build that constantly generates alts if you want but you just have to invest heavily in concentration as opposed to in the damage stats or the health stats or something like that okay i think this about covers the strategic layer and i'll see you guys in the tactical layer All right, guys, let's talk a little bit about the tactical layer of Urtok. This is where you'll be spending most of your time in this game. This is where this game really shines. Um, it's a constantly evolving thing, again, being in early access. But um, I think there's a number of features that I can talk you through that will kind of make your quality of life a lot higher uh, than you might otherwise get. So let's get to that. So first off, this is the deployment zone. We've just accepted a fight. We've walked onto a tile with an enemy and have engaged uh, that fight. Our goal is to protect this guy. This guy is probably not active right now. A lot of times uh, friendly NPCs do not activate until you get to a certain radius, until the enemy gets within a certain radius of them or some event occurs. Um, the enemies are active. Uh, enemies don't always start active when you engage villages or um, especially villages, but sometimes also fortresses, you can find some of the enemies not quite active until you get to a certain radius of them or a certain number of turns have passed. So it can be uh, good to engage incrementally. But here, all the enemies are gonna be active and this is just a straight up 3v3 with our starting fight. Um, you can, even after engaging, you can choose who's active. I can remove these guys or put them back in. I can bring up to six people to this fight if I had them. All of my available characters for who would be available to be, available to be deployed would be at the top here. And you can see them here and you can put them anywhere in the zone that you want. A couple other things you can do here, you can retreat from battle. Uh, the retreat from battle will cost you a trillium cost. Uh, you can do this at any stage in the battle, um, but it's restricted to both the location from which you can retreat, which I believe is your starting squares, as well as um, you can't be engaged in melee with a character when that occurs. So it's much harder to retreat later on. So if you are gonna use the retreat option, you should do that generally pretty early in the fight. Um, you can cheese a fight. It's not really cheesing it. You can wear an enemy down by engaging them once, then retreating, and then engaging them again, or engaging them once, uh, losing some characters, and then engaging them again. That will work. You can do that. They do take persistent losses. So um, that is a, an available strategy. Um, something else to know when you're here, this new button here, which is pretty new in the early access upon releasing this, but it's a really cool uh, development. It's open party management. Um, this allows you to change items around uh, between fights. So even though, let's say I had 12 people, but I only had two, three item sets maybe, and the guy uh, who I wanted to have in the fight um, doesn't have the right items equipped, I can, after the fight starts, but before combat, so during the deployment step, I can go and change my items around, which is super, super cool, which means that you can um, customize for the fight you're fighting, and you can bring the guys you want to bring for the fight you're fighting. A um, couple things you can do at the start of the fight, uh, you can see the elevations, this is holding down the shift key, this is really useful for understanding uh, the terrain around you. Uh, you can also see the pathing. If you select a character you want and hold Alt, it will show you the path you take to try to get to a location that you want to go to. So this is very good, for example, if I was over here and wanting to know, well, can I get that? Is this, a, is this passable or impassable terrain? Well, it's passable. And if it wasn't passable, it would show me something like this. It says, can I walk through that? No, it can't walk through that. All right, let's do a breakdown of the types of terrain that you're going to see. Um, this is fairly simple terrain um, compared to what else you can encounter. Uh, the red spikes are death pits. Any character being moved or pushed into one of these death pits will die. Um, these are spikes. Spikes do percent base damage to you. Uh, you can also encounter poisoned or, um, bl or bleeding spikes, each of which will uh, convey that status effect to you if you move on to them. This is uh, mud. Mud is uh, slow and you'll be guaranteed to be crit on if you stand in that tile and someone attacks you. There's also burning oil, which has um, a status effect of doing damage to you. Um, and that's about the... Oh, and then there's a number of uh, pieces of terrain. Terrain is impactful. I can... This being here, if I knock somebody into that, that's essentially knocking them into a solid wall and it will convey a negative status effect to them generally in terms of speed. Um, at the moment, you can see the turn order of the deployed units. 
So as I deploy more units, you can see my turn order changed because my monk is gonna go, my monk is faster in terms of having more agility than the guardian. So the, my monk will go first. Most of the times you start ahead of your opponents, but not always in the later stages of the game. Some of the opponents are very fast and they will start ahead of you, especially if you don't level your agility. But we can see the turn order in, in this game of how it's gonna play out. All right. Um, a lot of this game, you should, you should be thinking about moving things around and about positioning and about timing on the engagement. So I'm gonna show you just kind of like some of the cool, like basic ways to encounter this. The first thing that I see is the location of death pits and hard objects around here. Um, our monk has a flip ability. That means he can take an enemy and toss it over his shoulder. Some enemies are immune to this, and you can tell that by hitting control and mousing over them. And this will show you in the gray brackets what uh, abilities that enemy has. This enemy only has siphon power. If he had stalwart, it would mean he would be immune to flip and I couldn't toss him. This ability has sharp eyes, range support, light foot, discipline, and battle hardened. This person has siphon power. Once the combat starts, you can uh, show info on a character to read what those abilities do, but this is, uh, as a player who's played a little bit, having access to what the, the, the names are will tell me a lot of information about those characters. And the turn order really, really helps as well. All right, so let's say that um, I'm going to take this fight. I'll try to be a little cute with it, but um, nothing amazingly fancy here. Let's say that um, I wanted to set this up in a way that it's actually not going to work. Okay, I'm going to get a free toss there. I want to charge that guy. I'm not sure we're going to be able to charge that guy very efficiently. Maybe there and charge and see. There's like a, I think it's I think it's a mixed outcome there. Could even rotate him. I rotate him and force him in a position that matter? Maybe, because then we can move this guy back. All right, so if we move forward, toss that guy, move up and rotate him, get him out of the way, except it doesn't really get him out of the way. Rotate him over there, that would work. And then we can charge him into that wall. That seems okay. We can set up to kill him, maybe the turn after. With like a bash from there. Can we get there after if we end up there? We can. Okay, so this looks like, I'll show you the kind of the sequence that I just mapped out there for doing this. But I wanna, as we're doing this, not only show you the cool things that can happen in a fight, but kind of the things to be thinking about here. So the first is turn order. So we start the combat off here. Um, the enemies kind of tell us what's going on. Sometimes there'll be events that are in play that will change the environment or sometimes change the deployment. You can have three or four way faction fights. Uh, sometimes enemies will uh, convert to your side if they're the last remaining enemy. And, and this flavor text often tells you what's going on with that. The flavor text between on this, this layer and also on the strategic layer between them will tell you what's going on. These guys are basically saying, we're gonna kill this guy and then we're gonna kill you. So it's kind of a fight to the death, that's fine. Um, here, now if I want to know what that ability does, it's like, what does Siphon Power do? I can read what it does. Um, something else that becomes available once you're on uh, this phase, if you hold down Alt, you can see the, the turn order here. And we were getting that deployed, we were getting that on deployment, but this is also really useful for mid-fight, figuring that out. Um, this timeline on the left reflects that. So we can see right now the Monk's first, the Guardian's second, the uh, Footman's third, and then it will be those four guys, and then the Monk again. But that order can A, change as status effects are applied to people that slow them up or speed them down. And B, when there's more than seven or eight people on that, this list doesn't get longer. It's still only this many uh, tiles in there and there might be 20 or 30 people in the fight. So holding down Alt will let you see the numeric uh, number of the turn, which is a really, really, really nice uh, feature. All right, so for us, we're gonna start off with, um, it's the top of the round. You can tell this because it's timeline 100. Rounds are, um, seamless so it won't announce that it's round two but that's essentially what's happening and you can see on this round two would basically be where the monk acts again some units if they're fast enough can act multiple times in a round and i'll try to uh, point that out none of these characters will be fast enough for here but it's basically you get over a specific amount of uh, timeline after your first action and you will go again in that same round um, that number has changed already once in uh pre-alpha or pre uh, pre-release and I expect it will probably change again so I don't want to be too specific about those numbers because it won't it won't stand the test of time in terms of what's going on but just be aware that speed uh, modifies the number of actions you can have in a round as well as your order in that round so you can act sometimes two two to three times in a round if you have a very high speed character all right so we're going to move over and we're going to flip this guy there is zone of control. So you saw that I moved from outside of his tile. Melee has zone of control anyways. So I moved from outside of his zone of control into his zone of, his zone of control and I can't move again. Uh, even though I have three total movement points. All my movement points go to zero for moving through that because he's exerting a melee zone of control. 
Um, units don't attack if you move in or out of the zone of control. You just can't do anything with that unless they have a special ability called Engaging Strike, which will um, uh, stick you to them, kind of. We're going to toss him into the pit. The pit's a death zone. He enters the death zone. He is dead and gone. All right. Our next move is going to be to get our charging dude a little bit closer. Uh, I want to charge that thing. Um, it actually doesn't matter here. But let's say I wanted to move up here. Uh, I want to show you guys timeline stuff, so I guess I don't have to be super, super efficient in this as much as I want to uh, kind of just talk about what's going on. Um, you can see the monk has now moved from timeline 100 to timeline 20. If we go over here, we could do something like bash this guy. Bash has a slow effect in it. We've subtracted 60 speed from him. He's fallen down in the turn order. I don't think we've knocked him low enough in the turn order that he won't get a turn, but now our monk is going ahead of him again even though our monk has already acted once. All right, come up here. We're gonna charge this guy. We charged him into the rock because charge has a pushback effect of one tile. So we hit him and charged him and it bashed him into the rock. When it bashed him into the rock, it stunned him. Um, basically this lowers his timeline again. So even though the timeline started up as the six people going in essentially the, the order that they each get a turn, we have denied them Denied one other guy straight up by killing him. Denied this guy. He's now way down in the turn order and three of our guys will go ahead of him again. And this guy goes after our monk. Um, we have 72 stam. Let's talk about stamina. This is the next thing. You can always use an ability you have as long as you have one stamina, but you'll pay for the extra stamina that you use. So a basic melee attack is 50 stamina. A basic, excuse me, a basic melee attack is 40 stamina. A basic uh, ranged attack is 50 stamina. Certain abilities have certain costs associated with them. The flip ability had a 50 stamina cost. The jump ability has a 50 stamina cost. I only have 72 stamina, but I can do something like this. I can jump to here. That uses 50 of my stamina, so I'm down to 22, but I can still flip. And what this is, is I basically will be minus 28 stamina for next round, and I will have to pay that difference at the start of the round. But as long as I have at least one stamina on this round, I'm able to take actions. And I can toss this guy into a pit and kill him. All right, this guy walks over and hits us. I'm going to just set up for a flank. So anytime you have an enemy flanked uh, full 180, you get, crit, you get free crits on him. So I'm going to set over here. I'll hit him once. Then I'll come over this way, and I'm going to do two things with this. So the first is I'm going to flank him by charging him and hitting that tile. So then I'll be on either side, we'll 180 him, and that means I'll get a free crit. The second thing I'm going to do is by pushing him into my ally, I trigger a retaliation strike from my ally. So as long as my ally has at least one stamina, my ally will get a free swing here. So we're going to slide into him. There's our free crit. There's the retaliate, which is also a crit because he's one flanked. And this turn then, we've had some very, very, very efficient attack. All right, so we talked a little bit about the timeline. Um, talked a little bit about stamina. Um, certain units, well, as I already said, so break even break points on stamina are 40. But if you think about it, when you level stamina, the, the points you're trying to look for are one above the cost of your abilities. So if you have a, an archer, an archer that has 50 stamina can shoot exactly once. An archer who has 51 stamina, if he has an ability that lets him multi-attack, can fire twice in that round because he gets that one stamina. Same with melee, 40 compared to 41, 80 compared to 81, etc. right? So you got the timeline stuff. We already talked about changing the party, we talked about the terrain. Um, I showed the interface, so here again we can see that happening over here. Let's walk over here and hit this guy. Um, the monk applies a slow when he attacks, so we can see him get moved down in the turn order. And then we can bash him into this. The bash itself uh, will slow him, do damage, and then push him into my ally who gets a retaliation swing. This is why the combat is so addictive in this game. because. It takes like the best elements of things like uh, Tactical Genius or Into the Breach and combines it with elements like Battle Brothers. So you get this, um, you get this, these fights where positioning is super important between the positioning of the terrain and your positioning of your units and how you move the enemy around. And then you have to be worried about the fact that the enemy can often do that to you as well. Okay, uh, the final thing I want to talk about in this video is um, gaining traits, mutators, and transforms on your characters. So this is the result of the fight we just took. Um, we get 
basic standard quest, uh, mission rewards of, of Trillion and Life Essence for beating the enemies. That 44 Life Essence we can immediately invest into one of the um, mutators if we want. The mutators are based on the types of enemies we fought. There was a fairly limited number of enemies in there and they had a very limited number of attributes. So the only mutators being offered to us are range support or sharp eyes. We could pick up a range support if we wanted to. We don't have an archer right now, uh, but let's say we did. Let's say we picked up um, a range support and that would be the end of that fight. We hit close and we go back to none of our guys got enough experience for level. Um, experience is based on kills uh, as well as, I think, I don't know what percentage goes based on kills, but it's a fairly high percentage. So units that kill a lot will get a lot of experience. Um, and most of the bash toss abilities split experience. They don't give the kill directly to that unit, even though that unit is directly responsible for it. But all right, we also picked up uh, a Javelinier, um, and now we have these abilities that we can equip. So this character, has Lightfoot as a default ability. The Monk has Quick Learner as a default ability. This guy has Engaging Strike, Long Weapons Reach, etc. Each class basically has basic abilities that come with it. They also have abilities that they're likely to unlock as this class, and not even likely, they will unlock as they level up. The Monk gets something like uh, where he Revitalizer, which heals him when he reaches match focus, and gets Aegis when he reaches max focus, he casts Aegis on himself automatically, um, things like this. There's also attributes that you can unlock that will become available based on situational stuff. If your characters get repeatedly wounded, they will uh, develop a trait that is based on being totally uh, wounded all the time that gives you some small amount of healing and a max HP. Um, if your characters get to a place where they're near death, where they um, uh, like would basically die, they can develop Angel's Pact, which is a kind of... Um, uh, near death experience kind of thing that can happen once per fight. If they are uh, attacking ranged units a lot, they could get strong versus ranged. Each character will get a single strong versus attribute and then later on a second strong versus attribute and that's based on the units you're attacking. Uh, if you're getting poisoned a lot, you'll develop poison immunity, etc. So it's a really cool way of um, developing quirks, uh, permanent traits on your characters, uh, both based on level, class, and also situation that they encounter which is all very, very cool and very customizable. I expect that to change a lot as the game continues. Um, but another way you can gain attributes is you equip mutators. So this mutator gives me the ability uh, range support. Range support means that one of my allies attacks something and I can hit that thing and I have stamina, I will support that melee attack by throwing a ranged attack. Um, and I'll equip it here. Uh, the base, this is a level one mutator. Uh, mutators can go all the way up to level 10. Um, you can see what it improves for for each level of this. So this mutator keeps the same ability, but every time I upgrade it, it, um, it starts off as giving me minus 10% HP when I equip it, and eventually it will give me positive HP if I level it all the way up to level 10. Sometimes the effect of the ability can get go up too. So maybe, um, like, let's take a speed item, right? That maybe gives me 20 speed on a critical. It might go all the way up to 30 speed on a critical as I upgrade it 10 times or something like that. So these uh, each character can have three mutators equipped. Um, mutators will eventually be absorbed. Um, so if I take enough fights and the number of fights is based on the cost of the mutator, this was a 22 point mutator, I think this is a 44 point mutator, the number of fights, uh, if I have them equipped for all of those fights uh, over a large period of, long period of time, large number of fights, I'll get the option to absorb it. If I absorb it, I lose the, the, the mutator, but it becomes a permanent aspect of that character. Um, the number of mutators your characters can absorb is limited, so you'll have to choose which ones you find most important, and you will lose the item when it happens. But absorbing range support, I won't take the minus 10% HP penalty penalty and I will get the effect and that means I can do something cheaply and usefully have this ability for the rest of the game. All right, so I wanted to show you guys what it looks like when you're absorbing mutators. So you can see that each class has a different number of mutators it can absorb. My guardian has three, the monk has one, the priest has uh, one, the archer, uh, the hunter has two. Um, and you can see what it looks like as you move towards it. So my monk has had quick reflexes equipped for 60 fights. If I had not already absorbed a previous mutation prior to that, I would have the option of absorbing that uh, and taking that in. And also I wanna show you um, the scaling elements of an item. Uh, you can see, for example, let me pick up this, uh, not this one, that one has the same static effect. This one's one of them. Um, so this one not only has an HP and bonus damage effect, uh, but that changes as the item levels up, as it becomes max level, the, the HP penalty changes and so does the bonus damage, both of those are changed. Um, the other customizable thing outside of mutators, and absorbing mutators are focus ability changes. You can collect uh, focus items that will let you change your focus up. We didn't show this in the in the preview battle because you don't get it to level four. But essentially, um, based on your fo based on your um, your concentration, your focus gain is represented here, and it, uh, it changes the number of hits required till you get your focus. Your focus is a shared ability that appears in the bottom left hand corner of your screen um, when you're in the tactical fight. You can have up to five stored 
If you get a sixth when you have five stored though, it will replace one of your existing ones and you can cast those on any character. So although, um, let's say that I was looking at the, um, the buff that the Berserker gets, in this case it would be Last Stand from the, her, the item that equipped, even though the last stand is generated on the Berserker and is added to that pool by the Berserker, I can cast that on any one of my characters. And I can do that on anyone else's turn. So this becomes a very important uh, tactical element of how you're using your focus abilities and how often you're getting focus abilities. And you can change your focus abilities around later by items that you pick up. So you can customize what the team brings to a fight in terms of focus abilities, which is super cool. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to talk about recruitable characters and transformable characters. So. As it stands right now, uh, again, uh, pre-release, so this may change the number, uh, you can change into either a werebeast or a vampire. Uh, to do this, you have to encounter werebeasts or vampires in the world and then become infected by them and then allow your character to transform into that. They will get an associated upkeep cost of either flesh or blood, but they will get the stats of a werebeast. Um, and this will change um, some of the, uh, A, the base abilities they have, but B, also some of the attributes that they uh, can get and will get from being that class. So those are kind of cool ways you can customize your characters. You can build towards getting spe spe um, specific classes infected by specific types of uh, diseases. And then finally, you can recruit. Every, every character that you encounter pretty much with a few exceptions is also a recruitable class somewhere along the line and there's like i think five factions in right now or something like that and you can recruit from all five of those factions uh, and get them to be on your team so not only do you have all the base starting guys but you also have all the additional enemies that you can fight across the course of uh, a campaign to add to your roster anyways um hopefully this is helpful for you guys hopefully this covers the basics and then a little bit more of the game and you guys can dive in and actually gain some uh experience playing this gem of a pre-release and i can't wait to see what comes out of this game across uh, its development cycle thanks guys for watching and i'll see you soon